Well, hello, church. Welcome to Easter. It's Easter. Let's stand and worship Christ today together. Amen. so grateful you're here. You may be seated. 
And right off the bat, let me just apologize to you for uh, the fact that we started late. Thank you for your patience. For those of you who were patient, uh, for the rest of you, we just uh, fall on grace here. We had a great problem in the last service. We just had a huge overflow, uh, had the rink occupied as well. It was just a matter of, we had so many people to get off the property and on the property, and we apologize to you. Thank you again for your patience. But we want you to know, we're so glad you're here. We're going to try to make up for the time in flight, if you will. But um, thank you for bringing the church into these rooms. Uh, We've gathered here for a purpose. That purpose, I think you know, it's to worship God for who he is and what he's done. He is the God who is the resurrected Savior. He is the one who has brought us life and hope and a future and joy. And that indeed is a reason for us to gather together and celebrate. And we welcome you here. If you're new to Northland, man, we're glad you're here. We'd love to connect with you while you're here. We'd love for you to come back. We'd love to just hear your story a little bit, and there's several ways that you can help us do that. Uh, We've got a big connections weekend going on back in the foyer. I don't know if you noticed when you came in, but uh, the thing that's great about this is, is ministry leaders and teachers and leaders of small groups are all gathered back there, and you actually can talk to the leaders of all these groups and ministries. And they would love to connect with you and plug you in to the things that they're doing and consider this an invitation to join in and get connected and become a part and and belong with us. We'd love for you to do that. There's also uh, coffee and donuts and jelly beans back there in the foyer. Never underestimate the power of caffeine and sugar on your spiritual life. I'm a living example of that. It's the only example I am, but, um, but we hope you'll st- stay a little bit after the service and just have a little time here with us and, and uh, let us tell you about other things that are going on. We also want you to know that we're a church not only here in lovely Longwood, Florida, but uh, there's a number of folks that are gathered with us right now from all around the world. Uh, web ministers Bill Geary and Nathan Clark are connecting with you guys from all over the place. We're so thankful that uh, you've joined us online through our platform on our website or, or Facebook Live or YouTube or Roku. However you got here, we're so glad you did. We also are gathered with some groups. There are folks gathered at Watercrest down in Lake Nona. Welcome to you. There is a distributed church in Deland, Florida. There's also a distributed church in San Luis, Colorado. As you know, a part of Northland gathers out in Oviedo. A part of Northland gathers in Lake County. We also uh, give a shout out to our friends up in the upper room, our access ministry friends that are up there. We love you guys. Glad you're worshiping with us. And also our friends at the Wayman Place Senior Living over in Longwood here. And then also the Seminole County Correctional Facility in Sanford, Florida. Listen for this. That's for you guys. That's for you guys. So again, a lot of connections that we'd love to make with you. Maybe one of the most important connections you'll make, though, right now is just to take a moment and stand up and meet and greet and welcome one another. Great job. You may be seated. Hey, I would be really remiss if I didn't tell you this is so this is our last service of uh, this Easter uh, celebration this weekend. We've had an amazing time yesterday and today, but uh, I just want to thank we've got an amazing technical team that has worked behind the scenes here for weeks to prepare this. Would you just give a warm applause and thank them? These guys back there and up there. They create this environment that this amazing worship team then fills. And again, these guys have worked really hard to prepare for this. And we don't normally do this, but I just want to thank them for all the work that they've done. 
A part of that worship team today, someone that I don't think you know is a good buddy of mine, is, is Jamie Porte over there on the piano from Atlanta, Georgia. Jamie, blessings to you, buddy. Love Jamie. And then also coming out here right after the message today is the Ballet Magnificat is here. We've been trying to get these folks here for a long time, and uh, they will actually, uh, you'll be amazed at what they do. Don't leave after the message today. We've impounded all your cars anyway. So <laughs> that's just the April Fool's joke. I mean, but, uh, we didn't really, but I really want you to see and experience these guys, and it's part of our service today. And so Easter, again, is this big exclamation mark. If you were here on Good Friday and Pastor Sean reminded us of Good Friday's the comma, but today is the exclamation mark because it reminds us of the amazing way that Jesus loved us, loved us in a way that not only frees us from our past, but pulls us, impel, compels us into a future together. In that first scene that we get of Easter where the woman goes to the grave and Jesus is not there, she thinks. thinks. And then Jesus, in talking to her, says to her, woman, why are you weeping? And who are you looking for? Those two questions were as relevant, are as relevant now as they were then. Who are you looking for today? Because Jesus wants you to find him. And we know that as joyous as Easter is, it's also sometimes a reminder of how not joyous our lives can be. And especially we know some of the stories that you have gone through even in the past week. And so joy is something, though, that we want to continually put back in front of you. For the last several months, Pastor Matt and I have been going through with you a study in the book of Philippians where the message over and over again is joy, rejoice. And again, I say to you, rejoice. And so how can we live that joy out, even in the difficult parts of life, but knowing that Easter is the exclamation mark for that joy. Well, we do it by fixing our eyes on Jesus. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12 says that we should fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And then it says this, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. The Father in heaven, who at the beginning of his earthly ministry had said, this is my beloved son. You should listen to him. So how did Jesus live out this joy even in the most difficult week of his life between Palm Sunday and the night he was betrayed? Well, there are clues in what he taught in that week before his crucifixion. One of the last teachings that he probably did was for a group of people where he talked to them about the kingdom and described parables of the kingdom, one of which was a parable of two servants, one who was given a certain amount of, of goods and another a larger amount, and the one with the larger amount returned more, returned double what he had received. It's a parable not so much about income or resources as it is about faithfulness. Because the message that servant heard was well done, good and faithful one. Enter into the joy, the joy of your master. I think for Jesus, that was telegraphing that other verse of it was for the joy set before him. Jesus was headed to a cross, but he was headed there for the joy. Because when you think about it, only Jesus is good. Only Jesus is faithful. Only Jesus really deserves to hear those words, well done, good and faithful one.
Why has my God, my soul forsook, nor will a smile afford? Thus David once in anguish spoke, and thus our dying Lord. Oh, it's your chief delight to dwell among your praising saints. And yet you hear us groan as well and pity our complaints. Our fathers trusted in your name and great deliverance found. But he's a worm despised of men who trod him to the ground. Men shake their heads and pass him by and laugh his soul to scorn. In vain he trusts in God, they cry, neglected and forlorn. But you are he who formed his flesh by your own mighty word. And since he hung upon the breast, his hope was in the Lord. Why would his father hide his face when foes stand threatening round? In his dark hour of deep distress and not a helper found. Why, oh why, my God?
because of the joy of Easter, we know that Jesus didn't contain this joy just for himself. He included us in his plan, in his provision. And so because of his goodness and faithfulness, he has called us to take this same place in the Father's provision. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says this, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conforming with the purposes of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession in the praise of his glory. This is the good news, brothers and sisters, that we are called to lay down the emptiness of the life handed down to us and take up the fullness of Christ himself. We are to leave the past behind and move toward the future where he is making all things new. And like him, we run out of our graves as surely as he did. Would you stand and let's sing. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried. To hide, it was my turn till I met you. You called my name.
Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that we can sing that not as just an energetic religious song. We can sing that as a proclamation of what is true because you validated that truth in your resurrection. We are here not commemorating a religious leader who was martyred and then rumors of his influence spread and therefore we called it a resurrection. We're here in the name of the one who is risen. I know we're in a lot of different places, here and online in terms of our journeys and what we're grappling with and how interested we are, how relevant we think this whole gospel thing is. Some of us are here just to be polite to somebody who invited us, maybe a family member. Others of us are at rock bottom, wondering, you know what, I've I might finally be ready to to hear something about this Jesus because I've been running from him all my life. And others of us are your followers. Maybe our hearts are cold. Maybe our hearts are on fire. But bottom line, you've got us all together. And you want to say some things to us, including me. I, I ask that I would listen along with my friends and we would listen with anticipation, understanding that your spirit's here. Your word is truth. And we're asking you to speak into not our religiosity, but our humanity in the name of the risen Christ. Amen and amen. You can have a seat. Well, happy Easter. Man, you guys are ready to go. You're not, 
Did you eat before or after? That's always the dilemma, you know, with the 12 o'clock crowd. And I think you guys have some energy that you got from somewhere, so thanks for encouraging me in that. So I've said Happy Easter. There's one other happy I've got to tell you in terms of what day it is. Happy. Okay. Yeah, a few of you got that. Anybody had an April Fool's prank pulled on them yet? Uh, anybody thinking now of doing one on someone as a result? I've had a few on me over the years, and I've pulled a few, but uh, there's an article in CNN about the greatest April Fool's pranks of all time. Uh, this hoax website ranked them over history, and they came up with the number one April Fool's prank of all time. Would you be interested in what it is? 1957 is when it happened. The BBC in England, as an investigative journalism show that started in 1953 and is actually still going. It's the longest-running investigative journalism TV program ever, and you know TV was a new medium at the time. In 1957, the BBC's news program Panorama, kind of like our 60 Minutes, did a very serious uh, explanation and report of a bumper harvest in northern Italy, in southern Switzerland, right there on the border. They had one of the most famous journalists of the day, one of the most famous journalistic voices of the day, do the narration, and it messed with people for a long time. Why don't you take a look? 1957. It isn't only in Britain that spring this year has taken everyone by surprise. Here, in the Ticino, on the borders of Switzerland and Italy, the slopes overlooking Lake Lugano have already burst into flower, at least a fortnight earlier than usual. But what, you may ask, has the early and welcome arrival of bees and blossom to do with food? Well, it's simply that the past winter, one of the mildest in living memory, has had its effect in other ways as well. Most important of all, it's resulted in an exceptionally heavy spaghetti crop. The last two weeks of March are an anxious time for the spaghetti farmer. There's always the chance of a late frost, which, while not entirely ruining the crop, generally impairs the flavor and makes it difficult for him to obtain top prices in world markets. But now these dangers are over and the spaghetti harvest goes forward. So you've always wondered where spaghetti came from? Now you know. Spaghetti trees in northern Italy. They were dealing with that for years. Kids, I, I saw a blog about this, and a guy, an elderly gentleman said, yeah, I was in, in grade school uh, at the time, and my teacher asked about, we were talking about pasta, and I said, I know where spaghetti comes from. It grows on trees in northern Italy. And she said, what? And she said, I, he said, I saw it on the BBC. It's got to be true. It's kind of like the internet these days. He goes on, by the way, to describe one, another reason for the bountiful harvest is the absence of the spaghetti weevil that was destroying the crops, as well as the uniform nature. So April Fool's pranks are a lot of fun. The last couple of weeks, though, I've heard in two different conversations, one kind of joking that some people talk to me about, but the other one, I wasn't part of the conversation. It was more sardonic and sarcastic at a table nearby at a restaurant, people talking about the irony of Easter Sunday being on April Fool's Day. And in the sardonic, sarcastic category, they were talking about how appropriate that there would be some kind of commemoration about Jesus' resurrection on a day that commemorates hoaxes. I went back and forth. I wasn't part of it, so I didn't pretend on my way by. I politely I smiled and asked a question that I thought they could think about for a while. But is this resurrection thing a hoax or is it real? Millions of believers over the years have gathered together to celebrate that it is real. And let me clarify what we're celebrating. We're not celebrating the resurrection of Jesus' memory or His teaching or his ideas. We're celebrating the literal, bodily, historical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it is on that hinge that all of Christianity rises or falls. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17, and if Christ is not raised, our preaching is useless. 
And so is your faith. You're, and later on in that same passage, he says, we have all men are to be pitied. We're wasting our time. But if he is, we're gathered here because we believe deeply that he is. And it's not a blind leap in the dark. Tons of people over the centuries have sought to disprove the resurrection and have ended up coming, becoming followers of Christ. There are mounds of evidence that would stand up in a courtroom. And you can look. You, we've got some books in our bookstore. You can look online. Lee Strobel's Case for Christ, Case for the Resurrection, among many others, where they go through the, and, and examine the resurrection. There are three hinge points, three key categories of evidence. One, that the tomb was empty. Why was it empty? Had the disciples gotten the wrong tomb address, or had they stolen the body? If they had, they wouldn't have given their lives for the fact that Jesus rose. Did the religious leaders steal the body? Well, if they had, all they had to do is produce the body when this Christianity was spreading. Uh, Did grave robbers rob the body? All of these different aspects that have been explored. The second category is the appearances of Jesus, that he did not just appear to one or two people, he appeared to many people in a variety of circumstances, one time to over 500 eyewitnesses at one time. And when that record was written down and distributed in the region, many of those people were still living. They could have disproved it. The third category, it's not just the tomb was empty and Jesus was visible, but the followers were transformed. People, skeptics became passionate Uh, representatives of Christ. Cowards became courageous. People will give their lives for what they think is true, even though it's a lie, but people won't give their lives for what they know to be a lie. And so over the years, the reason that the church has burgeoned and swelled is hinging on the resurrection. If you are on the outskirts of a relationship with Christ and wondering, where do you start? Start with the resurrection. Dig around, poke around. Jesus invited Thomas to say, hey, Thomas, feel my hands and my, my, my feet, my side. Go ahead, ask the tough questions. And the resurrection is something that we gather together to commemorate, not because it was a martyr who gave his life and rumors of his resurrection continued, but because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. And as a result of his resurrection, we know that what he said is true. It validates all his, uh, all his other teaching. Now, there's not a day that goes by in my journey that I don't at least for a brief moment, sometimes it's just a couple of seconds, acknowledge that, okay, Jesus, are you risen or not? And because he's risen, I can trust the rest of what he said. I can embrace the rest of what he did. And so theologically, the resurrection validates the veracity, the cogency, the historicity of of Christianity. But practically, what difference does the resurrection make? For you, for me, when the alarm rings on a Monday morning, what difference does the resurrection make? Yes, it validates Christianity, but what about when I'm about to move into my life on a Monday. Well, here's an image I'd like you to have in your mind about what difference the resurrection makes in my life on a Monday morning. You're saying it's about blowing out candles? Mm. Yes, this is a candle. That's part of my uh, acute ability to clarify that, which is obvious, so I'm exercising it right now. But is this candle right now fulfilling its purpose? I mean, it was a second ago when it was lit. Right now, it's not. This candle looks like a candle, but it is not doing what a candle meant to do because it's no longer ignited. I want you to keep that image in your mind and turn with me to the last chapter of Luke's gospel, Luke 24. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love to give you one as our gift. Go out in the back, pick one up. We'll also get your name and address. We want to put you on a lot of religious mailing lists, so make sure you provide all that necessary information as well. Just kidding. We're here to help you in your journey. Anybody who wants to honestly and authentically investigate the claims of Christ, we want to help in whatever way that we can. It's too important for you to ignore. Even if this might be a kind of a rote tradition your family has done, maybe it's time. And maybe the hinge point will be saying, looking at the so what of the resurrection that we see in this passage. Now, here's the the situation. It's the Sunday afternoon after Jesus rose again. A couple of his followers are walking along a dusty dirt road towards a village called Emmaus. And they're like this. They're like this candle. The light's out. 
You see, so many of us, without our, our hearts being ignited, we're surviving, we're not thriving, we're existing, we're not living, we're spectating, we're not participating in this thing called a human journey. And they had been all aflame just a couple of days before, and now they were dejected, dreams shattered, hearts shuddered. You know what that's like. It's, it's part of living in a fallen world. It might have happened to you even this week. Maybe something, a vocational, a job situation. Maybe it's a relationship issue or something emotional or some, some news from a doctor or a financial tragedy. Whatever it might be where all of a sudden we're dejected and we're close to giving up and we're just existing. That's where they were. Everything they had dreamed that was going to be true is now shattered. Verse 13, Luke 24, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. I love this. He's, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? In the Greek, it's, Hey guys, what's up? Not really. They stood still, their faces downcast. Two huge, huge phrases. All right, they're going to stop for a minute. They're reflecting. Their faces are downcast because their lives and their world has caved in. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? He keeps... He keeps playing them. He says, well, what things? Yes. Well, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. But the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. That's the language of an extinguished heart. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that he had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as a woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, meaning first books of the Old Testament that were written by Moses. Jesus, beginning, beginning with Moses and after all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread he gave thanks. He broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and at once went, they returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Now go back, go back to verse 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? Were not it our hearts ignited? Were not our hearts lit? while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Do you want to know the so what of the resurrection on a Monday morning? It's heartburn. But not the kind of heartburn that requires some medication. It's burning heart. It's a heart that's inflamed. It's a heart that's ignited. My heart is at the core of who I am. So is yours. The Bible talks a lot about the heart. 
In fact, about 783 times heart appears. Only, five, only 596 times is the word heaven referenced. Heart is everywhere because the heart is at our core. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. The heart is where I dance, where I dream. It's also where I despair. It's where I do life. My heart is not just my emotions. My heart is at the epicenter. Basically view it as a hub with three spokes, my mind, my emotions, and my will. When my heart is engaged with my mind, I'm thinking deeply. With my emotions, I'm feeling authentically. With my will, I'm acting intentionally. When we see an athlete who's playing with heart, we're not just saying they're emotional. They're playing with a real fire in their belly. And what that does, they're, they're very keen intellectually on the game plan. They know the game. They know their craft. They're very skilled with their hands. And they're, uh, they're, they're passionate with their emotion, and it all comes together. And where my heart is, that's where I am. And when we get beat around by a fallen world and lose heart, that's when we just start existing instead of living. And the Bible says the gospel is aimed at the heart. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, so believe with your heart. It's not just a matter of getting a religious mantra and reciting it and memorizing it. It's not just a matter of raising a hand at a church service. It's not a matter of a nice feel-good moment. It's me in, as a whole human being engaging with this good news of the gospel, believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. The gospel is all about me intellectually engaging with the veracity of what Jesus said, me emotionally engaging with the relevance of what he says to my need, me with my life changing course because of the resurrection. And it all centers in on a heart that's vulnerable and a heart that can be extinguished. Now, i got a book here by L. Frank Baum. Anybody want to guess what the title is? The Wizard of Oz. You ever heard of that? He wrote this after he saw the movie. He thought he'd write, write a book. <laughs> Just kidding. The book came out before the movie. I know that's a shock to some of you. You get a lot in the book that you don't get in the movie. For example, the tin man who was looking for a heart explains to Dorothy and the scarecrow how he lost his heart. You don't know how he lost his heart? Interested in finding out? He was in love. I'm going to say this with a straight face because it's very serious to him. We just don't, he was in love with a munchkin girl, okay? <laughs> he was a wood chopper. That was his craft. He was a woodsman. And they were going to get married. But she worked for an old woman who was very lazy and didn't want her to, this young girl to get married because then she wouldn't have anybody to do all of her work. And so the old woman schemed with the wicked witch to put a spell on the young man that would prevent the marriage from happening. And the wicked witch uh, cursed the young man's axe. And over time, as he was doing his business, uh, accidents would happen and appendages would be lost. And each time he would go to the tinsmith and have an arm or a leg made out of tin made happen with his head as well until finally he was all tin. But the, the deafening blow in his journey was when the axe laid on to his heart and destroyed it. He explained to Dorothy and the scarecrow, he said, when that happened, alas, I now had no heart so that I lost all my love for the munchkin girl and did not care, did not care. That's what happens when you lose heart. He said, I didn't care whether I married her or not. Now, you know the deal in the movie where he was all rusted and they had the oil can and got him going again, and that's accurate. He was out in that, he was in those woods for about a year before they came along. And he said, I had plenty of time to think. And he, he says, I was left to stand in the woods until you came to help me. It was a terrible thing to undergo, but during the year I stood there, I had time to think that the greatest loss I had known 
was the loss of my heart. It wasn't my arms, my legs, but it was a loss of my heart. When I was in Scotland years ago studying there, I went to a museum. There was a silver gilded drinking bowl called the Watson Maser. It had an inscription on it it's from the 16th century. And the inscription says this, money lost, little lost, honor lost, much lost. heart lost, all lost. That's where these disciples were. And then the resurrection became very real to them. And as a result of the resurrection, an ignition took place. And they were able to engage. I've got three wicks here, so let's look at three wicks because we go through this passage. Three realities with which they were able to engage with an ignited heart. Here's the first one. Makes the resurrection very re relevant to me on a daily basis. It has to do with my story. I'm, I'm equipped because of the resurrection to engage with the redemption of my story. Uh, you go back through the passage and you see over and over they're talking about being on the way and on the journey. Our lives are a journey. Where you are in your journey and where you are in your journey and where you are in yours and where I am in mine, we're at different places. We're at different pages in the story, but we're all part of a great story. But we get dejected, we get beat around, we get pressed down, and the older we get, the shrapnel accumulates in our heart and we lose hope. We lose heart. And we don't understand what it all means. Are we just lucky blobs of protoplasm that came together by accident? Is just the only thing that's real, what I can see and hear and smell and taste and touch? Jesus is the risen Christ comes and says, that's not all of reality. And I can believe Him because of the resurrection. I can believe that my story has hope. My story has redemption. Sting, the artist, he wrote a brilliant song called The Book of My Life. The lyrics go like this. He said, it's the book of my days and it's the book of my life and it's cut like a fruit on the blade of a knife and it's all there to see as the sections reveal. There's some sorrow in every life. If it reads like a puzzle, a wandering maze, then I won't understand till the end of my days. I'm still forced to remember, remember the words of my life. There's a chapter on fathers and a chapter on sons. There are pages of conflicts that nobody won. And the battles you lost in your bitter defeat, there's a page where we fail to meet. Though the pages are numbered, I can't see where they lead. For the end is a mystery no one can read in the book of my life. Another page is going to turn tonight when you, your head hits the pillow. Mine too. Tomorrow morning, a new page. What will happen? What's the purpose? And the, the older we get and the more the shrapnel accumulates, the more we lose heart. As Henry David Thoreau famously said, all the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. We lose heart over time. And then along comes the resurrection in which Jesus says, I know it's difficult. John 16, 33. He says, I want to tell you something that's going to give you peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You will. But he says, I want you to take heart. And he says a reason. He says, not, hey, let me just give you a little religious formula. He says, let me tell you why to take heart. Because I have overcome the world. At the epicenter of that was his resurrection from the dead. If he wasn't risen from the dead, no reason to believe that. But because he is, I can trust that he has overcome. And he is doing what he said he would do in the process of renewing all things. Restoring creation. In this mysterious plan between his first coming and the second coming, there is purpose going on. And there will be no purpose 
pages of my story left on the editing room floor of my life. He says he's able to redeem it. He's able to draw me in to the original purpose that I was made for, not just to look like a human being, but to function like one to the glory of God. Jesus didn't come to make us religious. He came to restore us to a significance of our humanity being lived to the glory of God. That's why he came. That's what the resurrection can do when my alarm rings on a morning. But there's a second wick here, and it's not just engaging with my story. It involves engaging with the Scriptures. It's not just looking at the redemption of my story and having a realistic hope that my story is going to be redeemed. Wherever it is, whatever failures have happened, that's realistic to hope that because of the resurrection. But there's also a relevance to the Scriptures. A lot of people think, okay, this is one of many religious books. Jesus said it's more than that. This is the Word of God. He endorsed it. So if he hadn't risen from the dead, I wouldn't need to pay attention to it. But because he did, I need to pay attention to this. Go back to the text for a minute. In verse 27, it says, In the beginning, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning himself. Now, Scriptures, what he's referring to there is what the Jews would have referred to as the Tanakh, the um, these first five books of the Old Testament and the Old Testament itself, the, Old, the Moses and the prophets, and Jesus walked to them through and saying, there is something going on that you've missed. Understand this. All of the Bible is one story. It's a number of small sub-stories, but it's all about the great story. And Jesus explained that to them. The reason we've offered you a Bible is not to give you something to go on your coffee table. But something to begin to read, saying, where do I start? Start with the Gospel of John. Saying, can this book speak to me? Not in to improve my religiosity, but to fulfill my humanity, to give me a direction. Dante Alighieri was an Italian poet in the 14th century and wrote a classic that some of you had to read when you were in school called Commedia Divina, Divine Comedy. Dante's Inferno. He's writing it about himself, the first line of that treatise. He describes himself as a 40-year-old man, and he says this, In the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost. Jesus says, this book can be your light. Why should I believe him? Because he's risen. He says, this book is about me, and my life is your light, John chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus answered, it's written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Psalm 119, verse 32, he says, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. My heart gets set free by the word of God. And Jesus walked them through the veracity, the trustworthiness of the Bible. It talks about from Moses to the prophets, all that was prophesied about him. In the Old Testament, there are about 300 prophecies about Jesus. I've mentioned this before. Uh, Peter Stoner from Westmont College years ago took the top 48 of those prophecies about Jesus' first coming and calculated. He had some graduate classes help him do the calculations. What would the odds be of all 48 of these prophecies written hundreds of years before Christ came about where he would be born, where he would die, how he would die, the circumstances of his birth, etc.? What are the odds of all 48 of those prophecies being fulfilled in one man? And he, they came up, calculated it, submitted it to the American Scientific Affiliation, and they said that these numbers are accurate. One in 10 to the 157th power are the odds of 48 of those 300 prophecies being fulfilled in the same person. That's one in 13 trillions together. So in other words, what are the chances of all 48 of just those, the, just those 48 prophecies being fulfilled in one man? One in a trillion, 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 trillion. That's cause for pause to say, maybe this isn't just another religious book. Maybe it's what Hebrews describes in chapter 4, verse 12, for the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. 
It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And no wonder Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Emile Callier was one, a brilliant philosopher in the 20th century. He was an atheist. Prevented Bibles from being in his home. He started reading the Bible in his 20s. His wife brought one home against his wishes, but then he started reading it. And he wrote later, he said, finally I had found a book that would understand me. The scriptures all of a sudden take on a new significance. It's not just a religious duty. It's a way for me to navigate this thing called a fallen world. But there's a third wick. It's not just having to do with my story in the scriptures, but it has to do with me engaging with a relationship with the Savior. Not just the redemption of my story, that ignites my heart. Not just with the relevance of scripture, that will ignite my heart. There's something powerful about the Word of God, but there's also, it ends up, most importantly, the resurrection leads me to engage with a relationship with the Savior. It's not a passive thing, it's active. I begin to walk and grow in a relationship with Him just like anyone else. Go back to the text. Look at verse 30, 30, 30 in chapter 24, verse 30. When He was at the table with them, I mean, I've, I've read this verse over and over. I tried to picture myself there. They hadn't been recognizing Him all day. He had been expositing, explaining Scripture, and then it says this. When He was at the table with them, He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. What was it? I believe the language there is leading us to understand that they made a connection between what they had experienced just three nights before when Jesus gathered in the upstairs room before he gave his life and he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. He took the wine and he poured it and says, this is my blood poured out for you. And all of a sudden it hit. On Sunday, they realized he, on Thursday night, he was talking about the crucifixion being something intentional. Here they had been thinking it had devastated his plans, and now they realize it fulfilled it, and it fulfilled it because now they could have relationship with him. All that he had taught began to fall into place, that he had come not for himself. The Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. He had come denied, not as a religious martyr, but as a substitute. For you and me, dying on the cross, not for his sins, but for ours. To pay an infinite penalty, it would otherwise take us eternity to pay. And if we would receive his payment on our behalf on the cross and receive him as Savior, we're restored into a right relationship with God, and then all of a sudden, we're burning on a heart level with our humanity. Understanding our stories are significant. Understanding that the Scriptures can lead us. Understanding that the Savior wants an intimate relationship. He is not interested in your religiosity, nor mine. He's interested in intimacy. As I work, as I play, as I dance, as I grieve, as I create, as I rest, He says, relate with me, I love you. You think, really? He demonstrated his love on the cross and validated that love by his resurrection. We can trust it. And when those doubts come, we go back to the resurrection. When I ask my wife, Arlene, to marry me, it was like two or three years ago, maybe longer. She was a student at Wheaton College. I'd graduated, so I picked her up and took her to the mall. I know how to show a girl a good time, I tell you. <laughs> but she did not know that I had already been to the mall that day with a dozen roses. And I went to 12 different stores, found a clerk in each of those stores that knew it was going to still be working that night, gave that clerk a rose and a card with Arlene's name on it. And I said, when I walk back in, I don't blend into a crowd very easily, so you'll recognize me. And I walk in, the woman that I'll be with, if you'll walk up to her and say, congratulations, Arlene. First couple of times, it was, it was quite a trip because 
totally unexpected. Then it became like an Easter egg hunt. Which store are we going to go in where they'll have a rose? So after 12 rows, she's got a, 12 roses in her arms. We're walking around. People are following us uh, in, in the mall. We get to a restaurant after that, and the waiter comes up with another gift and says, congratulations, Arlene. And that, that, that gift had a card with it, gave her hints about where we were going next, which was the boathouse at Lake Ellen in Glen Ellen, Illinois, that I had talked the park district into giving me the keys to, a college student. Trust me, guys, uh, you can trust a college student with the keys to the boathouse and this recreation center. But some reason they did it. I had everything laid out there, asked her to marry me, popped the question, she said yes, and then took her back to her house. House. It was well after midnight. I knew I was going to get there after midnight. And so I dropped a card on the way out the door after Arlene had left. When I picked her up, she walked out and I was behind her and I threw the card back so that they would be sure and see it. Explained to them what was going to happen. And I said, would you put this card on her pillow so that she'll see it when we get back well after midnight? So we actually looked at it this week. It says, dear Arlene, so grateful that you're my wife to be. I can't wait. I love you, Matt. There's one other item that I put on the card. I knew it was going to be after midnight, so I simply dated it for the next day. And so in the top right hand corner of that card is April 1st. So Arlene got in all sleepy and thinking we were all engaged, and then the first thing she looks at in a note from me is April 1st. And then she said, no, I know this is real. So it might be April Fool's Day, but know that no April Fool's Day can challenge the historic rescue of Jesus Christ of this planet that is the epicenter of which is in his resurrection from the dead. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are a savior that we need. Now we're at various points on the map of acknowledging our need for you as savior. But I ask that you would give us the courage to humble ourselves right now in the midst of our journeys with hearts that might be lost and numb. Maybe we've encountered tragedy or we've encountered betrayal or we've encountered a purposelessness. Give us the courage to come to you as Savior to relate with you. Give us the courage to begin submitting to your word and to see its relevance for our journeys. And, and, and give us the hope of having stories that are not meaningless but can be redeemed into the great scheme of what you're up to in this cosmos. Now right now, before we leave here, give us the courage to be still in your presence and own up to the fact that we actually need you as Savior and can trust that you're that Savior because you are risen from the dead. you never stop to pull me through what would this life have done if you never whispered liberty I hear you sing so sweetly a song There's none more beautiful than And here I found myself So I'm happy to be lost in you I hear you sing so sweetly A song of love 
needs a savior every soul needs a savior Listen, you can just stay up for a minute, if you would. So that was our own Michelle Alexander and Ballet Magnificat. And what they so beautifully and, and clearly demonstrated for us is the essence of what Easter is all about. Whom are you looking for? As we ponder that question, we know that every soul does need a Savior. And Jesus has come to give us that assurance that he is the one we're looking for. If you know that's where you are today, we want to encourage you to consider after the service, there will be some folks down front here. They would love to pray with you uh, about anything at all, but especially your need to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. We also want to remind you that our connection weekend going on back there in the foyer, I think we've pretty much eaten all the donuts. You guys finished them off. 
but we want you to connect with those group leaders and, and uh, coaches and team leaders back there in the foyer. We'd love for you to be connected before you leave here today. And then there's one other connection that we want you to know about. Pastor Matt's going to come up and share that with us. So we really do care about your journeys, and uh, we joked about putting you on religious mailing lists. That's not our, uh, you know that's not our desire. Our desire really is for you to engage with the gospel where you are right now. We've got an amazing opportunity waiting on you after the service at the Connect area, yes. But two weeks from today, next week, we're going to continue this, talking about what does it practically look like to walk with Christ as a risen Savior. But then two weeks from, the, from today, this afternoon, the, four, the 15th of April at 4 p.m., a friend of ours named Max McLean, who's a Broadway-caliber actor and also a C.S. Lewis expert, is going to be with us. And he's going to be performing something that he's performed uh, around the world and very rare. In fact, I don't know that he's ever been in a church, performed this in a church before. It's usually in theatrical venues and they were talking about Dr. Philipson or something else and wanted to come here. It's called The Most Reluctant Convert. And these are cards that are going to be available out in the foyer for you to gain more information. You can go online. 4 p.m. is the performance. And what he does is he portrays C.S. Lewis in expert fashion, award-winning fashion, and walks us through, Lewis being, I know he's favorite author of, of Vernon's as well, and for many of you, one of the great apologists of the 20th century, meaning defenders of Christianity, but he was first one of the most vehement atheists. And so he talks through in this hour and 20 minute play, he's C.S. Lewis with us in his study, processing his journey. I mean, it's, it's mesmerizing. And I'd encourage you to come invite someone. Those of you who are kicking the tires, you're, you're not sure, you're skeptical, uh, know that Lewis, that, that title, The Most Reluctant Convert, comes from a phrase that Lewis uses himself. He says, I was the most reluctant convert in all of England, but I was pursued. And as a bonus treat, Lewis, uh, Lewis that'd be interesting if C.S. Lewis would be with us in our services, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Max McLean will be in our services, and during the, the, the sermon, uh, he and I are going to interact about Lewis's journey. The title of it would be A Skeptic Surrender, God's Pursuit of C.S. Lewis and You and Me. What does that look like? And that's on our, our normal worship services that weekend of the 14th and 15th of April, but then on the Sunday afternoon, April the 15th at 4 p.m. is this. Make sure you invite somebody. So, but until then, we've also got a little bit of a tradition that I've discovered some things about this weekend. We do indeed have a tradition here, Matt. It, it is to sing this wonderful song. I've been saying in the other services that we've been singing it for 30 years. I heard One Bill correct And Bill corrected me back there. He said, we've been singing it 40 years. Uh, that's older than I am, so I don't remember that. But um, <laughs> they always laugh at that. But... Um, but we missed it one year, we just didn't program it, and it almost shut down the church, so we don't want to miss it this year. So, hey, you're already up, we might as well sing it together. Let's sing Easter song together. Thank you. 
And so there is a traditional benediction that we also use called the Paschal Greeting, and, and uh, I think you'll know this one. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's the power by which you live your life. Amen. Happy Easter.